let's start the second session of the day. For that, we have three eminent speakers with us and two chairpersons. May I invite Dr. Dharmendra Panchal from Ahmedabad and Dr. Malay Parik to take over the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tirti Ma'am, for warm introduction. And special thanks to our mentor, Dr. Bansi Sabu, sir, for giving me this wonderful opportunity in 12th World Congress of Diabetes India. And also thanks to Diabetes India team and Dr. S.R. Arvind, sir, Amit, sir, and Manoj Chamasan, and many more. Uh, with me, my dear seniors, my friend, Dr. Dharmendra Pancha, sir, also to chair the session. And we have three eminent speakers. So over to you, Dharmendra, sir. Yes, thank you, Malay, for uh, being here. And by heart, thanks and welcoming all of you for the Diabetes India 2022 and for this session, the state of our lecture. I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Vijay Viswanathan from Chennai. Dr. Vijay Viswanathan will be going to speak on benefit from EDOTS, Chennai study on the importance of diabetes among the tuberculosis patients. Dr. Vijay Viswanathan, he is MD, PhD, FRCP, presently head and chief diabetologist at MB Hospital for Diabetes and Professor MB, M. Viswanathan Diabetes Research Center at Chennai. It's a WHO collaborating center for research, education, and training in diabetes. Diabetes is being the president 21 to 2023 the food international based Belgium, consisting for experts from 193 countries. He is being national vice president of RSSDI, completed 29 years as a diabetologist with having PhD in diabetes nephropathy. He has published. 50 research paper in this field. He developed a specialty diabetes food care in India by training 2,000 or more physicians in prevention of amputations, setting up a state-of-art podiatry center in Chennai since 25 years and publishing more than 150 original research paper in diabetes food. He has been awarded a fellowship of Royal College of Physicians London for his research contribution in diabetes. Over to you, uh, Dr. Vijay Viswanathan. Thank you, Dr. Panchal. I'll take about 10 minutes only and I hope to take my questions because I'm in the midst of a busy OP. So I'll finish my questions and then leave. I'll take 10 minutes to make this short presentation. And I'm quite convinced and my job is to convince all of you that uh, one minute, I'm just sharing this slide. Full screen. Yeah. My job in the next 10 minutes is to convince all of y'all that when you have a person with tuberculosis, like in pregnancy, you should consider the hyperglycemia as important. And I'm going to show you some data from our EDOT study, which is effect of diabetes in TB severity. You know that India, uh, let me see the pointer. Yeah, you know that India uh, even beats China in, the, in, the, in terms of the number of people with diabetes, in t TB, I'm sorry. Uh, you have more uh, TB patients per lakh population, even compared to the global scenario. But the government of India is very serious. It wants to end tuberculosis by 2025. And that's possible only if you take my talk seriously. So what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes or 9 minutes is very important. Now, it is a pity that in many countries, which you can see the green color, these are low middle income countries. You have a high prevalence of both tuberculosis and diabetes. That is the, the arrow is wrong. The coloring, the shading is wrong. The green color indicates the number of people with diabetes and TB. Therefore, this is a situation in a country like India and Brazil and China. Uh, you have more of diabetes and more of TB. And uh, you can see the cross section, the intersection between the two. Now, earlier we were talking about HIV TB uh, connection. Now we are not talking much about HIV TB, we are talking about diabetes and TB. And what all we said for HIV TB is applicable to diabetes TB. You can see it's more difficult to diagnose TB patients, there's more increased death, there's more increased recurrent TB. So, what all be said for HIV TB is now being said for diabetes and TB. This was the first paper which 
uh, interested me and this was by involving the rntcp program who rntc program where we found a very high prevalence of diabetes and pre diabetes among tb patients in india this was reported in plos 1 uh, several years ago 10 years ago we found that there was a very high prevalence of uh, newly diagnosed diabetics as well as kdm known diabetics as well as newly diagnosed diabetics so we found that uh, it was very important and then we also reported <clears throat> this got the best paper from vivian fonseca award from ada in chicago in 2013 we showed that if you have diabetes your smear positivity remains for a longer time you remain sputum positive for a longer time if you have uncontrolled diabetes and this was published in vivian fonseca's journal himself a journal of diabetes and its complication with that background i now move on to the last 7 minutes of my talk about the e dot study so with this background we started looking at the effect of diabetes on tb severity which is called the e dot study which was part of a report consortium report is a big consortium uh, which is funded by the government of united states and government of india dbt and nih so we were fortunate enough to be included in this cohort uh, report cohort and this was a first Hello. Hello. I think uh, sir has lost the connection. The network okay. issue is there. can we call the rx team please can we call okay. can we wait 2 minutes yeah we may wait for couple of minutes till he joins hello what happened today sir connectivity issue dr vishwanathan has lost connection so we are just waiting for that should i call vijay 
Vishwajit is from Bangladesh. Is yes, he joined? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello. Sir. So, Vishwajit, I mean, just waiting for Vishwanath. I'm just trying. Vijay, I mean, you have disconnected the Wi Fi. The Wi Fi. Vijay is joining eh? again in one minute. Okay, sir. Yes. He again got connected. I don't know whether you can see him or he's if he's there, we can ask him again. Yes, joined. He joined. He joined. Yes. Yeah. Now he's there. Now. Yes, Vijay, you can share your remaining slide. There was a power failure. I'm sorry. So I'll finish in another three minutes. No problem. There's a full, full slide. Yeah. So what we found was uh, I'm going to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. What we found in the study was. The newly diagnosed diabetics. So these are people who, whose uh, HP1C was 6.8, as you saw in the previous slide. And you can see that they were diabetics, but they were not previously known diabetics. But you find that the radiograph radiographic severity of tuberculosis was much more uh, among the people who were having high blood sugar, uh, among those with KDM also it was high, but you can see that newly diagnosed had a very bad X-ray finding of tuberculosis. Now, we found that irrespective of the A1C, the low BMI was reaching statistical significance. You can see that the failure, the death was more among people who had low BMI. So if you have low BMI and if you have insulin resistance, which, is, which we measured by the visceral adiposity index, uh, we find that the mortality was much more, the death rates were much more. Therefore, it was not the blood sugar as such which was important, but it was the BMI and the insulin resistance which was more important. We also looked at the cytokine levels and you can see that uh, you can see the genetic uh, component on the left side and the protein component on the right side. And the diabetes and TB is represented by this violet color. You can see that there was a higher expression of the cytokine levels among patients who had diabetes and TB, uh, you can see here. And also, we also found that when we compared the patients from pre-ATT to month 18, about 12 months after they completed tuberculosis treatment, among the TB diabetics, which is shown in the orange color, you can see that inflammation persists. So higher cytokine levels persist in spite of the fact that they have received the full tuberculosis treatment for six months. Therefore, there's this persistent inflammation despite TB treatment. Now, what about metformin? There is a theory that metformin helps in tuberculosis. It was Amit Singhal from Singapore who showed that. And we found that certain MMPs, we measured MMPs, and we found that certain MMPs were lower in people who were taking metformin than people who are not taking metformin. MMP7 was one classic example uh, where we found that the uh, MMP7 levels were lower among people who took the uh, metformin. My two last slides, what about pre-diabetes? In this study, the prevalence of pre-diabetes was about 41%. Pre-diabetes, 
prevalence of pre diabetes is very high. At the in, at end of the intensive phase, you can see that in the pre diabetics, about 23.8% still had sputum positive, whereas in the normal glucose tolerance, only about 86 Therefore, we found that if you, even if you have pre diabetes, it is associated with a poor outcome. Therefore, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the uh, power failure which happened. Stop sharing uh, and uh, stop sharing. Not able to stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I just wanted to tell you that if you find hyperglycemia then uh, in a person with tuberculosis, please do not consider it uh, as very uh, lightly. Don't take it very lightly. Take it very seriously. But those patients have a higher mortality and they have higher death rates, especially the BMI is low. So this is what we found. And uh, uh, there's one question by Dr. Kedia. Should we follow up all TB patients? From? Yeah, so for future diabetes and for future TB recurrence, we should follow them up. So if anybody with diabetes and TB or uh, TB patients, I'm sorry, TB patients having hyperglycemia, you should follow them up for at least one and a half years, even if you have given them complete TB treatment according to RNTCP, you should follow them up for at least one and a half years and see if they're getting recurrence of the TB and also worsening of hyperglycemia. Because as I showed you, the inflammatory cytokines last for a long period after you complete your TB treatment. Thank you, Dr. Kedia, for this wonderful question. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful deliberation. Uh, on this important topic and we will have the further more question answer at last and for the next session would like to ask my co-chair to invite our next speaker over to you dr malai thank you thank you dharmendra sir and now we have another eminent speaker dr biswajit sir from bangladesh and sir topic is cardiometabolic risk among the young adult population in bangladesh and nationwide survey and sir is a consultant diabetologist and director and executive diabetics care center diabetic association of the bangladesh he is a coordinator of center for global health research he is a coordinator of bads nationwide diabetes registry he is also a coordinator and preconceptional care project he is also coordinator diabetes prevention through religious plus assistant coordinator and distress learning program he is a treasurer diabetes inst asia study group and almost 20 years experience in diabetes association of Bangladesh. Main topic of research interest are diabetes prevalence, diabetes prevention, risk factors, obesity, metabolic syndrome, gestational diabetes, micronutrient deficiency, and diabetes education. And so also fellowship of International Diabetes Federation Education Foundation Fellowship in 2003, and also Japan Society for the Promotion of the Service in Fellowship in the 2015. And also various publications and book chapters, almost 37 scientific publications in the reputed peer review international journals and contribute the chapters in two books of the medical science and member of editorial board in more than 20 books and guidelines, including diabetes care, BADS guidelines in 2019, and also BADS diabetes and COVID-19 guidelines. So without wasting much time, over to you, sir. Sir, unmute, unmute yourself. Sir. I'm trying to, you know. Is okay? Yes, sir. Audible and visible. Okay. 
so it is okay yes sir so respected uh, chair persons and all the audience good afternoon so my topic of presentation is cardiometabolic risk among young adult population in bangladesh a nationwide survey it is a joint research initiative of non community disease control program of director general of health services of ministry of health and family welfare bangladesh and center for global health research diabetic association of bangladesh so outline of presentation includes backgrounds objective material methods result conclusion and including with some recommendation so we all know diabetes and other ncd including the 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals and the main aims to reduce premature death from the cardiovascular disease cancer diabetes chronic respiratory disease by 25% by 2025 so therefore ncd alliance international diabetic federation world heart foundation who call for a simultaneous action on diabetes and hypertension for more resilient health systems so now come to the bangladesh according to the bangladesh ncd risk factor survey 2018 ncd contributes 60% of the total death in our country if you see the slide in the right side the study also reports 97% of the study participants had at least one ncd risk factor which include current tobacco use less than five servings of fruit and vegetables less physical activity diabetes hypertension and overweight that indicates that the ncd will create huge healthcare burden in our country in coming years the national step survey 2018 also reported 8.3% diabetes and 21% hypertension in bangladesh we have found a difference in the variation in the prevalence of diabetes hypertension in different age group in diabetic association we also conducted a national survey in 2019 sample was 100000 and we also cover almost 90% of the whole country our survey reported 22.6% diabetes in bangladesh which is in line with the study conducted at the same time in the pakistan and the most of the country in the mina region but if you see the good knowledge only 38% of the participants had the good knowledge about diabetes you should know that 30% of the total population in bangladesh is young adult but still we do not have enough data related to cardiovascular disease in this age group considering all this we conducted a survey in 2019 2021 this is last year general objective of our study was to assess the prevalence of the cardiovascular risk marker include diabetes hypertension among the young adult population in bangladesh and its variation by the division urban versus rural location and individual level socio demographic and clinical characteristics secondary objectives were to assess the rate of the obesity dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome among the young adult population second was to assess the macro and microvascular complication related to diabetes hypertension in the young adult population third one to identify marker of the diabetes hypertension following different anthropometric indices and to develop the country specific cut off level for anthropometric indices including bmi waist circumference waist hip ratio waist height ratio and neck circumference The last one to investigate is the serum lipids including total cholesterol triglyceride ldl cholesterol hdl cholesterol separately and in combination and their association with diabetes and hypertension in this age group subject and method was a total of 2000 2460 young adults aged 15 to 35 years participated in this cross sectional study which conducted in the eight urban and eight rural areas a division of bangladesh from 28th august to 20th october 2021 we use multi stage cluster sampling techniques for the selection of the study sites and we also use the population percentage of the east division following the census of 2011 for sample distribution we use semester structure questionnaires and face to face interview for data collection so this is our study sites we cover almost all the part of the country all the division selection criteria inclusion criteria includes permanent resident both genders age in between 15 and 35 years being able to communicate willing to join the study exclusion criteria is less than 15 years and more than 35 years 
taking medication known to alter or JTT, unable and unwilling to give informed consent or communicate with study staff and currently pregnant. We followed the WHO step one, two, three procedure for collecting the study variables. Study variable includes sociodemetry variables, anthropometry variables, clinical includes blood pressure, vascular structure. We palpated the peripheral pulses, peripheral neuropathy, we used 10 gram monofilament and 128 hertz tuning fork, fundus photography with artificial intelligence and six leads ECG. And for the biochemical variables, fasting to after plasma glucose, HbA1c, lipids, urine albumin. We used WHO recommended point of care machine for biochemical analysis. This is the whole process, the work plans in the middle, the member of the study teams and the part of our volunteers involved in this study. National Professor Eki Azad Khan, President of Diabetic Association of Bangladesh was the principal investigator. Professor Akhtar Hussein, President of the International Diabetic Federation and myself was the co-PAI in this study. Now I will show the social demographic, some of the key findings of our study. Starting with the social demographic information. So 55.3% of our participants is 15 to 90 years. 87.4% participants were Muslim, which is in line with the census conducted in the 2011, which is the last census conducted in the Bangladesh. Urban participants and female participants found higher in our study. If you see the slide, 41% of our study participants had secondary level of education and 55% have college and above level of education. Majority of our participants belongs to the middle and high income group. Now come to the physical activity. More than 50% of our study participants live in sedentary. Only 12.2% were physically active. That's, they work more than 60 minutes per day. We also check the family history. 41.7% participants had diabetes. 53.2% had family of hypertension. Most 20% coronary artery disease. 60.5% cerebral disease. We use the Asian cut-off level definition for defining obesity and central obesity. Prevalence of obesity defined by the BMI was 26.5%. If you see the slide, Prevalence was 18.2% in 15 to 19 years group, which increased to 29 in 20 to 25 years, increased to 38.4% in 25 to 29 years. And we found the highest prevalence in the 30 to 35 years, which was 55.1%. 55 prevalence was similar in the male and female. However, the prevalence was found higher in urban population, which was 31.5%, which is in line with the previous study conducted in the different time point in Bangladesh. Now, uh, uh, so in our study, prevalence of the abdominal obesity, I'm not showing this slide, what's the problem? In our study, there is some problems in the slides. Can I take some minutes? So in our study, abdominal obesity was 26.5%. Prevalence was found higher in the urban and the female participants. And in our study, 71% of the participants had both central and general obesity. Mr. Uh, yes, sir. What happened? I think this is the slide, so it is not showing the uh, the background one. So can I change this? Can I give get some minutes to check these things? Can you please take your time? Okay. But sir, the slide is visible to us. It is okay, fine, but you know, the sum of the you know slide in behind is not showing.
okay, I'm just leaving this, this not reduced. The prevalence of diabetes was only 7.4%, which was 4.4% in the 15 to 19 years. And it was highest in, in the 30 to 35 years group, which was 21%. And diabetes was found higher in the female and urban participant. And almost 61% of our participants were asymptomatic. Among the symptoms, general obvious weakness was found the most common symptom in our study, followed by the increased urination, increased thirst, increased hunger, weight loss, and 22.5% of our participants had more than two and above symptom. Now the hypertension prevalence was 13.5%, which was 11.8% in the 15.19%, which increased to 22% in the 30 to 35 30, 20, 30 to 35 age group. And prevalence was found higher in the female, male, and urban participant. So 68% of our study participants remain asymptomatic. Header was the more common symptoms, followed by the neck pain, blood fission, tiredness, and 26.7% participant more than two and above symptom. Now the lipid disorder. The prevalence of the lipid disorder defined by the high diagnosis and low HDL cholesterol was 15.8%. Prevalence was 9.9% in 15 to 19 years group, which was 16% in the 22, 24 years age group, 28.7% in 24 to 29 age group, and a pound highest in 30 to 35 years group, which was 37.4%. Prevalence was found higher in the male and urban participant. Metabolic syndrome defined by the ATP3 definition was 23.6%. It was 15.6% in 15 to 19 years age group and found highest in 57.1% in 30 to 35 years age groups. Prevalence was found higher in the male and urban participant. In male, it was 25.8% and in urban participant, it was 25.4%. So we also checked the daily diabetes habits in our study participants. Almost 100% of the, our study participants eat rice regularly, 61.7% routine chapati, fish 31.7%, egg 32%, meat 8.4%, green vegetables 60.8%. I missed to mention the food habits. It was 23.5%, soft drink 17%, extra salt 73.5%, fast food 14.9%. Soybean was the most commonly cooking oil in our study. It was 78.3% participants use soybean regularly. In our study, about 90.3% participants had at least one NCD factor, which in line with the previous study conducted in 2018, we called it a step two survey. Depending on the current tobacco user was 11%. Eat less than five servings of vegetable at food was 98.3%. Less physical activity, 50.3%, which I already mentioned. Obesity 26.5%, hypertension 30.5%, and diabetes 7.4%. We also checked the association between anthropic indices with diabetes and hypertension. In our study, waist hip ratio and waist circumference have shown a significant association with diabetes, and the BMI and waist circumference have shown association with hypertension in our study. We also checked the association between blood lipids with diabetes and hypertension. Both LDL cholesterol and triglyceride have shown association with diabetes and hypertension in our study. So we also check the complications. Prevalence of the retinopathy was 4%, albuminuria 2.5%, neuropathy 3.8%, tachycardia 30%, atrial fibrillation 4.9%. If you see the prevalence of the retinopathy was 10.2% in 30 to 35 age groups, and albumin was 6.7% in 30 to 35 age group. In conclusion, our study revealed a high prevalence of the cardiovascular risk factor, including diabetes, hypertension in urban and rural Bangladeshi young adult population. We need more larger scale study with control population, include all the possible influence to confirm our findings in, re in recommendation. Early detection of the cardiovascular risk factor is likely to be cost-effective as timely initiation of treatment will prevent complication. 
thereby reducing the cost and unnecessary suffering both for individual patient and society. Ensure affordable access to fundamental care for people living with diabetes and hypertension. And finally, considering local contextual factor that may influence policy implementation, such as political, political support, resource allocation, ability of the local data for monitoring impact. Before leaving, I would like to give sincere thanks to all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my study data here. And thanks to all the audience for their patience hearings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for very well interactive and a wonderful talk. Uh, if you have a question in the last, so by that time, I have over to you my co-chair, Dr. Dharmendra Panchal, sir, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, uh, sir, for the nice deliberation. And do we have any question, Dr. Malay? No, sir. Uh, okay, we will go for the next session. Yes, please introduce. Uh, next session will be taken by Dr. Urman Dhruv. Dr. Urman Dhruv is going to speak on public healthcare system in improving care for diabetes. Dr. Urman Dhruv is a leading diabetologist from Ahmedabad. He is also one of the one additional degree of LLB. He is successfully completed course on fundamentals of medical ethics in 2018 December, coordinated by Norwegian Medical Association. Successfully diploma course on hospital administration from National Institute of Labor Education and Management in 2004. He is the director of Department of Internal Medicine and Diabetes of HCG Hospital Ahmedabad since 2003 has been visiting faculty uh, in third BDA student at AMC Dental College, has been an ethics committee member of HCG hospitals in 2010, taking medical legal lectures for doctors and one of the mentor for many uh, junior doctors, uh, one of the good teacher. Over to you, Dr. Ulman, sir. He has been... A few things would like to mention further. Yes, sir, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dharmendra, and uh, thanks, Diabetes India, for inviting me. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, sir. Your screen is quite visible. And I hope I am audible. So, yes, sir. Uh, it is difficult to say good noon from here because uh, it is 30 minutes past midnight here at uh, British Columbia, Vancouver with 2 degrees Celsius temperature. Uh, anyways, next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about public health care system in improving care in diabetes. We all know very well uh, this slide for years together that a race is being uh, going on between India and China to become number one, a very desperate position in diabetes. And it is the changing lifestyle that probably may lead to uh, India taking over China in next five years. We also know that diabetes was considered to be a disease of affluent people, but of late, even in India, the rural and the middle income people have started getting affected. Glycemic control is only one part of the story. We all know everything about glycemic control, and in the previous session, we had a long discussion that evidences are there, but it is difficult to apply those evidences. And we have to apply those or implicate those evidences with proper care. So we know everything about the glycemic control story, that is lower risk of hyperglycemia, control of cardiovascular risk factors, HPA1C, and avoid weight increase. Despite all said and done, 75% of people having diabetes live in low and middle-income countries, which are now called LMIC. We also know that 2012 issue of diabetes care suggested providing patient-centered approach. What is patient-centered approach? Providing care that is respectful of and responsive to 
Now, these two important words, respectful of and responsive to individual patient. So difficult to do in Indian setup. Uh, that we'll see in next few slides. We also know the decision cycle for patient-centered glycemic management in type 2 diabetes. And remember, this is equally true for any chronic disease. It could be hypertension, it could be obesity, it could be osteoarthritis. The cycle remains the same. Assess key patient characteristics. Consider specific factors that impact the choice of treatment. Share decision making to create a management plan. Now, just consider this for shared decision, how difficult it is, even in an urban tertiary center, shared decision. Probably we are making the mockery of the world. Agree on management plan, implement management plan, ongoing monitoring, and review and agree on management plan. Now, this is the decision cycle. Do we really follow it? or not. Diabetes Care Asia India study, diabetes care in India, what is the current status? The study that was carried out on 100 consecutive review patients in 26 participating centers, it suggested that 90.6% of patients had diabetes, type 2 diabetes. HB1C was more than 2% above the per limit of normal and fasting more than 139 milligram per cent. What were the results? Among persons with diabetes, discontinuation of care was found to be uh, associated with the worst glycemic control. Remember, we start treatment, we initiate treatment, but most of the patients discontinue care. And what's the reason of discontinuation of care? The reason is weak public health system. It's a major bottleneck in providing qualitative and quantitative diabetes care in lower middle income group countries, including India. So, glycemic control is only part of the story. Resource availability and resource management is another side of the coin. And that requires a strong public health system. Let's see. What is the current status in India? We all know the uh, NPCDCS, that is the National Program for Prevention of and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke, started in 2008 and implemented in 2016 in 100 districts with an idea of providing sub-center, community health care center, district hospital and tertiary care center where it was believed to work to control all these four important diseases, that is cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. But unfortunately, nothing much has happened till 2019. Five years since its inception, most of the things are on paper only. For example, health promotion for behavior change. It is not being done. Forget at subcenter. It cannot be done even at tertiary care center. Early diagnosis through clinical and lab investigation. We'll see what lab investigations are available at primary healthcare system. District hospitals were supposed to early diagnose diabetes, CVD, and stroke and cancer, and that's not possible because of lack of manpower. So overall. Although a good initiative, it has not been implemented properly. We'll stick ourselves only to diabetes. So what's the situation of diabetes care in public health facilities in India? A situational analysis. And look at this. The study visited five tertiary centers, eight secondary centers, and 17 primary healthcare centers, where the daily OPDs were between 35 to 200 at primary health care centers and 1,500 to 6,000 at tertiary care centers. There was no registration. Patients were supposed to keep their own case papers and records. When we looked at the investigations that were available, primary health care centers had only glucometers available, 
many a times without glucose sticks. HbA1c facility was not available at primary healthcare center, and fundus examination was available, and lipid screening were available only at tertiary care centers. Food care was available only at tertiary care centers, neither at secondary nor at primary care centers. The primary care centers had only sulfonyl urea and metformin to provide to the patient for insulin. The patient had to reach to the tertiary health center, and there too, it was provided for fourteen days. Insulin being provided for fourteen days from a tertiary care center to a villager who has to run back within fourteen days back to the tertiary care center. Dietary counseling, smoking cessation. nothing available at even secondary care center so we are not here to criticize the setup the setup is nice but it has not been implemented because of certain challenges most of the doctors at primary care facilities did not receive any specialized training in diabetes and we all know uh, 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 for last couple of years we have seen lots of efforts from rssd and diabetes india in uh, uh training the primary care facilities the doctors at primary care facilities which is very important because unless the doctors are trained nothing else could be implicated no written protocol for screening forget about the management there are no written protocols for screening whom to screen which patients are to be screened and how to be screened no universal blood glucose screening criterion being followed and no uniform criteria for screening there were operational issues also no regular follow up or tracking of patients because the records are not available the records go with the patient and unfortunately that's a tradition in most of the hospitals in india where the record goes with the patient either in the form of a booklet or in the form of a case paper patient overload too less time for each patient lack of specialist and manpower no dedicated team for diabetes care and we know that uh, dr sabu has been making all his efforts to provide dedicated team at all chc for management of diabetes and even diabetes india is working a lot behind it no system of back referral difficult to manage complication at psc and lack of lab investigation so what are the solutions multiple solutions all across the globe have been suggested various countries come out with different ideas the chronic care model developed by ed wegener in 1990 was the first to suggest that healthcare system design strategies that leverage clinical information systems and decision support tools in an offered to optimize population level disease care well that seems to be too heavy for india then came the lancet global health commission volume 6 which suggested that for all chronic diseases one should have equitable as you can see here resilient and efficient tools the equitable could be population based the resilient could be governance and uh, platform based and the efficient could be workforce or tools based if we start applying this to our psc and csc that may probably help another model is suggested 5r and to me this is most probably the best uh, model available for indian setup recognize risk factors register developing a registry for type 1 and type 2 diabetes at all village level at all town level would be very very important tool to begin following up the patients so recognize register resource proper utilization proper implementation of interprofessional teams relay facilitate information sharing between the person with diabetes and the team for coordinated care and recall develop a system to remind your patients go on hammering the patient with diabetes education and the way in which they are supposed to behave and that's what again this expanded chronic care model suggested 
that the health system should be a part of community it should not be separate from community same way the lancet commission in 2020 came out that each challenge may be affected by a particular strategy like demographics and ecosystem may be affected by context related policies diet exercise smoking alcohol sleep and stress may be effectively dealt with by community health literacy so this lancet commission came out with one strategy for every challenge what do we suggest we suggest the ireland model where person with diabetes is divided into three groups uncomplicated type 2 diabetes they should be settled at primary care only complicated type 2 diabetes care shared between primary and secondary care and type 1 diabetes they would go to secondary care who are uncomplicated diabetes they are not on insulin their diabetes is managed by lifestyle modification only or at the most they are on uh, two glucose lowering agent with hb1c less than 7.5 they have low moderate risk of diabetic foot no active diabetic eye disease controlled cv risk factor and normal hypoglycemia awareness and they have satisfactory renal function all these things combine to create a group called uncomplicated type 2 diabetes so what should we do try to manage every case of uncomplicated type 2 diabetes within 2 weeks of diag- diagnosis stratify them the moment a person is diagnosed in a village at a primary health care center immediately that person has to be stratified into whether he falls into uncomplicated type 2 or a complicated type 2 or type 1 and depending upon the stratification he should undergo all his treatment modalities at phc secondary health center or the tertiary center within 3 months of being newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes people should receive a structured type 2 diabetes education package and to me the education package is even more important than treatment it is just like if you teach he may have his good family but if you teach a whole school then it may change the society four monthly visit to referral center may be done and screening criteria should be absolutely perfect you can have the typical select, uh, screening criteria but all psc should come out with a uniform screening criteria and that is the second important thing two important thing screening criteria and registry that would definitely change the scenario in india so that should be added with tele consultation either in the form of simple intervention tele health technology or sms so this could be a digitally enabled diabetes care so finishing my last three slides important consideration in improving public health care system requires maintenance of patient records electronically or as case files with the health care system not with the patient patient should not come to tertiary or secondary facilities for drugs only they should come for complications routine follow up or for the referral training existing manpower or doctors is important specialized training courses for existing manpower to build the team develop a mechanism of referral and linkage equip psc with diagnostic and follow up laboratory investigation at present even hb1c is not available at phc that should not be the case and efficient procurement and indenting mechanism real time drug procurement system should be applied so summarizing my lecture diabetes care should be organized around the person living with diabetes and their supports the person with diabetes should be an active participant in their own care be involved in shared care decision making and self managed to full ability facilitated by a proactive interprofessional team with training in diabetes and the ability to provide ongoing self management structured evidence based and supported by clinical information and decision support system 
that includes patient registry and clinician and patient reminder thank you very much thanks a lot thank you sir uh, for this session here the, i would just open the test for the question answer if we have question and answer we can take further uh, meanwhile i would like to ask dr urman dhruv sir regarding uh, your opinion where involving where we can involve this digital diabetes care in routine care for the patient so how do you see and in routine what we can involve for digitalization in diabetes care which may be more convenient to the patient what is your uh, expert comment on this so uh, i would look at it two ways one in private care setup where it would be of tremendous usefulness because starting from smbg to random blood sugar from hypoglycemic episodes hypoglycemic unawareness blood pressure records hb1c everything can be managed even diabetic food can be managed by diabetic food care worker with this uh, digital technology or through even a simple whatsapp call so in private setup yes it is being used for last two years because of the covid uh, epidemic or pandemic as far as the organization or the government setup is concerned it is not being implied however if there is a telecommunication link that is a telehealth system between primary healthcare system secondary healthcare system and tertiary healthcare system most of the patients would not require to reach to the tertiary healthcare system frequently which they go as we saw they have to reach to the tertiary healthcare system even for collection of drugs so that would take even reduce the burden of uh, tertiary healthcare system also and that would allow tertiary healthcare system to concentrate on the complicated type 2 diabetes so absolutely certainly the uh, use of uh, uh, telemedicine would probably change uh, the the government setup and the private health setup thank you sir uh, we would like to have an uh, opinion on doc, uh, dr biswajit sir also uh, to we have uh, or what is the era of digital medicine or telemedicine there in bangladesh and on add on would also like to know you from uh, sir regarding cardio metabolic risk factor in diabetes at uh, bangladesh how uh, is there any specific risk scoring system uh, do we follow there clinically uh, to assess the cardiac risk factor and what is the prevalence of uh, you know prescribing coronary artery calcium score over there and utilization of this tool to assess the cardiovascular risk factor over to you sir for the years uh, questions the first co one was the digitizations yeah so uh, i think uh, in diabetic association we have the, the digital system and in the during the corona in the corona pandemic situation it helps a lot you know to manage it and give the care to the diabetic patient and we have the dedicated one and also government systems we have also the you know the digital systems for the for the diabetes not only the diabetes care and the whole in the care is now given by the you know digital systems so we have we have good platform and the come to the, the cardio metabolic in the, the risk assessments yeah so mainly the uh, in bangladesh currently who you know the the cardiac risk score is normally followed by the cardiologist uh, but most of the the, the the third question you ask you know the which one that the question was the calcium issues yeah so cardio, yeah artery yeah, yeah. calcium score some of the you know the advanced centers uh, in bangladesh uh, normally now use this score okay okay sir thank you dr malay do we, do you have any questions on this uh no sir there is no any question in the chat box also so i think uh, we are in the time so if there any new question otherwise we move on to our next session 
So thank you on my behalf to both the chairpersons and Diabetes India, Dr. Bensi and Dr. Manoj Chawla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Urman sir, for wonderful as usual and nice deliberation of talk. And thank you, Vishwajit sir and Vishwa Vijaynath sir for wonderful talk in the Diabetes India 2022. And special thanks to uh, Dr. Dharmendra sir for nice chairing the session. So over to you, Dr. Kirti ma'am, for next session. So that brings to the end of second session, a wonderful session of the day. Thank you, chairpersons and the speakers. Uh,